Welcome to Opinion Journal. I'm Mary Kissel. The Supreme Court will hear two landmark cases on same-sex marriage this term. The first on the Defense of Marriage Act and the second on California's Prop 8, which defines marriages between a man and a woman. So what's the conservative take on these issues? You don't hear it very much. Ralph Reed, president of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, is here. Ralph, welcome. Thank you, Mary. Um, Good to be here. Should this issue of same-sex marriage be in the courts in the first place? Well, look, I think that these kinds of issues should really be litigated in the public square, uh, at the ballot box, either through candidates or referenda, or in the halls of Congress uh, where the people's elected representatives make the decisions. You know, we have, a, uh, we have a case study on this, which is the Supreme Court trying to resolve a deeply contentious cultural issue, and it's called Roe v. Wade. And I think you could make a very strong argument that that court decision by trying to impose the most liberal abortion laws in Western civilization on all 50 states by judicial fiat made that issue more contentious, not less so. But Ralph, if that's true, that same-sex marriage should be litigated in the public square, then should we do away with all of the tax provisions that are pro-marriage? Well, I, I think that that's what is at the heart of these cases. You know, the fact is that the, the tax code does uh, seek to strengthen marriage through the amelioration of the marriage penalty, uh, the child tax credit, which is there to not only support families, but to uh, encourage people to have children and all these kinds of things. And my concern is that if the Supreme Court takes a position that the voters of California were wrong in deciding that marriage should be defined as between a man and a woman, then that lays the predicate for future courts to say that making judgments about the, the social value, the cultural good, if you will, of the family unit is undermined. Rob, same-sex marriage advocates, and they're everywhere in the national media, mm -hmm. uh, it, actually predominantly that's the argument that you hear, would say, well, gosh, what I'm doing isn't affecting you. Let the court litigate these cases. Uh, you know, everyone should be equal under the law. What do you make of that argument? Well, the argument that I would make is, I, w I was there, I was at the Christian Coalition when the Defense of Marriage Act was passed. The, the purpose of the Defense of Marriage Act was to make sure that if one state redefined marriage to include same-sex couples, that another state would not be forced to recognize their, their, those unions under their very different law. It wasn't to force anybody to live under the laws of uh, Georgia or Ohio. It was to make sure that people in Georgia or Ohio, or in this case, California, don't have to live under the laws of Massachusetts or Vermont. It seems to me the federal government has a legitimate state interest in making sure that's the case. And Mary, I would just remind your viewers and those who are debating this issue to remember, the Defense of Marriage Act passed by a margin in both chambers large enough to pass a constitutional amendment and was signed into law by a Democratic president. This was not out of the mainstream of American democratic tradition. You know, the mainstream of, of what is our democratic tradition of the moment changes. Mm -hmm. um, I want to put up a couple numbers here. Uh, Same-sex marriage in California, for example. Uh, 2003, 61% support. You compare that, here we go, we've got it on screen. 2004, it was only 44%. Ralph, what is changing in our society to see these numbers swing to that degree? Well, I think that what's happened, particularly among younger voters, voters under the age of 40 and especially under the age of 30, is they have a belief that, you know, hey, how does this affect me? It's sort of live and let live. Um, that, that is an, an intellectually defensible position to take. It's not one that I agree with. I think what we have not done as good a job of, Mary, is making it clear that there are social and cultural benefits to the intact, loving marriage and family of a man and a woman. Such as? Well, such as all the statistics and data that we have, which is that the people who are in those intact, loving families are far less likely to be involved in uh, the criminal justice system. They're far more likely to excel at school. They're far more likely to be model employees. I had a CEO one time tell me, uh, he said, we went back and we looked at our very best employees, the very best without respect to gender or race. He said the number one determinant of how hard they worked and how dedicated they were wasn't whether or not they graduated from an Ivy League university or had an IQ. 
It was whether or not they were an intact, loving uh, marriage and family. And there would be those who would argue, well, then therefore we should allow same-sex couples to have access Just to that same thing. Just what I was going thing. to ask. My counter-argument to that is we have not tested that thesis on a national level. The number of same-sex couples that are getting married, even in the states that have legalized it, is very small and the number of years that have passed is very short. And we should not, in my view, tinker with or revolutionize the foundation in culturating and socializing, socializing institution and the history of Western civilization willy-nilly, certainly not at the national level. Okay, well, you have the last word. Ralph Reed, president of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, thank you so much for being with us.